Welcome, everyone. Thank you for standing by for the Alphabet fourth quarter 2023 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Jim Friedland, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Alphabet's fourth quarter 2023 earnings conference call. With us today are Sundar Pichai, Philip Schindler, and Ruth Peratt. Now, I'll quickly cover the safe harbor. Some of the statements that we make today regarding our business, operations, and financial performance may be considered forward-looking. Such statements are based on current expectations and assumptions that are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties. Actual results could differ materially. Please refer to our Forms 10-K and 10-Q, including the risk factors discussed in our upcoming Form 10-K filing for the year ended December 31, 2023. We undertake no obligation to update any forward-looking statement. During this call, we will present both GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. A reconciliation of non-GAAP to GAAP measures is included in today's earnings press release, which is distributed and available to the public through our Investor Relations website located at abc.xyz forward slash investor. Our comments will be on year-over-year -year comparisons unless we state otherwise. And now, I'll turn the call over to Sundar. Hello, everyone. Our results reflect strong momentum and product innovation continuing into 2024. Today, I'm going to talk about four main topics. One, our investments in the AI, including how it's helping search. Two, subscriptions, which reach $15 billion in annual revenue, up 5x since 2019. Subscriptions is growing strongly, powered by YouTube Premium and Music, YouTube TV, and Google One. Three, cloud, which crossed $9 billion in revenues this quarter and saw accelerated growth, driven by our Gen AI and product leadership. And four, our investments and focus to meet the growth opportunities ahead. First, AI and search. As you know, we have long led the way in using AI to improve many of our products, from search to ads, to most of our consumer and enterprise products, helping billions of people already. Last year brought new excitement around Gen AI, and I'm proud of how we responded responsibly with deep advances in foundation models and a number of great launches. We closed the year by launching the Gemini era, a new industry-leading series of models that will fuel the next generation of advances. Gemini is the first realization of the vision we had when we formed Google DeepMind, bringing together our two world-class research teams. It's engineered to understand and combine text, images, audio, video, and code in a natively multimodal way, and it can run on everything from mobile devices to data centers. Gemini gives us a great foundation. It's already demonstrating state-of-the-art capabilities, and it's only going to get better. Gemini Ultra is coming soon. The team is already working on the next versions and bringing it to our products. That starts with search. We are already experimenting with Gemini in search, where it's making our search generative experience or SGE, faster for users. We have seen a 40% reduction in latency in English in the US. I'm happy with what we are seeing in the earliest days of SGE. It's available through search labs in seven languages. By applying generative AI to search, we are able to serve a wider range of information needs and answer new types of questions, including those that benefit from multiple perspectives. People are finding it particularly useful for more complex questions, like comparisons or longer queries. It's also helpful in areas where people are looking for deeper understanding, such as education or even gift ideas. We are improving satisfaction, including answers for more conversational and intricate queries. As I mentioned earlier, we are surfacing more links with SGE and linking to a wider range of sources on the results page and will continue to prioritize approaches that add value for our users and send valuable traffic to publishers. Beyond SGE, we are continuing to use AI to make searching more accessible and intuitive. Circle to Search lets you search what you see on Android phones with a simple gesture 
without switching apps. It's available starting this week on Pixel 8 and Pixel 8 Pro and the new Samsung Galaxy S24 series. And Lens now offers generative AI overviews. You can add text to a visual search to ask questions about anything you see and get AI-powered insights in the moment. In addition to search, we are also seeing a lot of interest in our AI-powered solutions for advertisers. That includes our new conversational experience that uses Gemini to accelerate the creation of search campaigns. Then there is BARD, our conversational AI tool that complements search. It's now powered by Gemini Pro and is much more capable at things like understanding, summarizing, reasoning, coding, and planning. It's now in over 40 languages and over 230 countries around the world. Looking ahead, we'll be rolling out an even more advanced version for subscribers powered by Gemini Ultra. That's a good segue to subscriptions. As I said earlier, it's now a $15 billion business annually. YouTube is the key driver of our subscription revenues. Available in over 100 countries and regions, YouTube Music and Premium have real momentum. They're engaging passionate users and driving great returns for the music industry and creators. YouTube TV is also doing well. We've had great consumer feedback on the viewing experience. People love the navigation, multi-view, and unlimited DVR. NFL Sunday Ticket has found its perfect home on YouTube, and Philip will talk about that more. Let me also talk about our subscription service, Google One. It's doing incredibly well with strong user growth. It provides expanded storage, unlocks exclusive features in Google products, and allows us to build a strong relationship with our most engaged users. Google One is growing very well, and we are just about to cross 100 million subscribers. From here, we are going to bring in more AI features and look forward to more strong growth to come. Next, Google Cloud. Throughout 2023, we introduced thousands of product advances, including broad Gen AI capabilities across our AI infrastructure, our Vertex AI platform, and our new Duet AI agents. In Q4, our product and Gen AI leadership enabled us to win and expand relationships with many leading brands, including Hugging Face, McDonald's, Motorola Mobility, and Verizon. Google Cloud offers our AI hypercomputer, a groundbreaking supercomputing architecture that combines our powerful TPUs and GPUs, AI software, and multi-slice and multi-host technology to provide performance and cost advantages for training and serving models. Customers like Anthropic, Character AI, Essential AI, and Mistral AI are building and serving models on it. For developers building Gen AI applications, we offer Vertex AI, a comprehensive enterprise AI platform. It helps customers like Deutsche Telekom and Moody's discover, customize, augment, and deploy over 130 Gen AI models, including Palm, MedPalm, SecPalm, and Gemini, as well as popular open source and partner models. Vertex AI has seen strong adoption with the API requests increasing nearly 6x from H1 to H2 last year. Using Vertex AI, Samsung recently announced its Galaxy S24 series smartphone with Gemini and Imagine2, our advanced text-to-image model. Shutterstock has added Imagine2 to their AI image generator, enabling users to turn simple text prompts into unique visuals and Victoria's Secret and company will look to personalize and improve the customer experience with Gemini, Vertex AI search, and conversations. Customers are increasingly choosing Duet AI, our packaged AI agents for Google Workspace and Google Cloud Platform, to boost productivity and improve their operations. Since its launch, thousands of companies and more than a million trusted testers have used Duet AI. It'll incorporate Gemini soon. In workspace, Duet AI is helping employees benefit from improved productivity and creativity at thousands of paying customers around the world, including Singapore Post, Uber, and Woolworths. In Google Cloud Platform, Duet AI assists software developers and cybersecurity analysts. 
Duet AI for Developers is the only Gen AI offering to support the complete development and operations lifecycle, fine-tuned with the customer's own code corpus and policies. It's helping Wayfair, GE Appliances, and Commerce Bank write better software, faster with AI code completion, code generation, and chat support. With Duet AI and security operations, we are helping cybersecurity teams at Fiserv, Spotify, and Pfizer. Our robust growth has been driven by strong direct and indirect channels. With ISVs, we have nearly tripled the number of co-sell deals from 2022 to 2023. In our ecosystem, there are nearly 90,000 Google Cloud Gen AI enabled consultants and Accenture has teamed up with Google Cloud to create a joint generative AI center of excellence. Next, let me turn to our focus and discipline as we pursue the opportunities ahead. Search, YouTube, and Cloud are supported by our state-of-the-art compute infrastructure. This infrastructure is also key to realizing our big AI ambitions. It's a major differentiator for us. We continue to invest responsibly in our data centers and compute to support this new wave of growth in AI-powered services for us and for our customers. Through this, we are being disciplined in how we run the company. You've heard me talk about our efforts to durably re-engineer our cost base and to improve our velocity and efficiency. That work continues. Teams are working to focus on key priorities and execute fast removing layers, and simplifying their organizational structures. As just one example, our devices team has brought together different teams from across Nest, Fitbit, and other teams into a new functional structure. This will help us pool resources and drive progress across our Pixel portfolio. Across different teams, we have wound down some non-priority projects which will help us invest and operate well in our growth areas. We are also improving our machine utilization, building on our years of experience in driving cost efficiencies in our computing infrastructure and operations. And through our supplier efficiency efforts and automation of certain processes, we have made major improvements in areas like procurement, achieving significant savings. That's a snapshot of the quarter before I close, a couple of other highlights. Pixel 8, our AI-first phone, was awarded phone of the year by numerous outlets. It now uses Gemini Nano with features like Magic Compose for Google Messages and more to come. In our other bets portfolio of companies, Waymo, which is deeply focused on safety, reached over 1 million fully autonomous ride-hailing trips. And Isomorphic Labs entered into strategic partnerships with Eli Lilly and Novartis to apply AI to treat diseases, which has great potential. 2023 was a year of profound innovation and product momentum. Thank you to our many partners. We succeed when our partners do, and we are grateful for the work we do together. From our partners across the Android ecosystem who are on display at CES, to our deep relationships with retailers, small businesses, and advertising partners to the next generation of AI startups and developers, and many more. I also want to thank all of our employees for their hard work throughout 2023 and the start of the new year. I'm excited for what's ahead in 2024. Philip. Thanks, Sundar, and hi, everyone. Google services revenues of $76 billion were up 12% year on year. In Google advertising, search and other revenues grew 13% year on year, led again by solid growth in the retail vertical. We had particular strength in retail in APAC, a trend that began in the second quarter of 2023 and continued through the end of the year. YouTube ads revenue were up 16% year on year, driven by growth in both direct response and brand. And network revenues declined 2% year on year. In subscriptions, platforms, and devices, which was previously named Google Other, year-on-year -year revenues increased 23%, driven by strong growth in subscriptions. Now for some color on the quarter, and where we see continued upside for long-term advertising growth. Over the last few calls, I have consistently highlighted how we're putting Google AI to work for our customers to deliver profitability and help them achieve their goals in a do-more-with-less environment. 
From a product perspective, in Q4, Performance Max remained a bright spot. We're also excited about demand gen momentum. This is our big bet to help social advertisers find and convert consumers via immersive, relevant visual creatives across YouTube, including YouTube Shorts, Gmail, and Discover. In a single campaign, you get access to over 3 billion users as they stream, scroll, connect, and decide what to buy. Tens of thousands of advertisers are testing, and on average seeing 6% more conversions per dollar versus image-only ads and discovery campaigns. As we look ahead, we're also starting to put generative AI in the hands of more and more businesses to help them build better campaigns and even better performing ads. Automatically created assets help advertisers show more relevant search ads by creating tailored headlines and descriptions based on each ad's context. Adoption was up with strong feedback in Q4. In addition to now being available in eight languages, more advanced Gen AI powered capabilities are coming to ACA. And then last week's big news was that Gemini will power a new conversational experience in Google Ads. This is open in beta to US and UK advertisers. Early tests show advertisers are building higher quality search campaigns with less effort, especially SMBs who are 42% more likely to publish a campaign with good or excellent ad strength. We can't wait to see how this continues to drive performance and level the playing field for advertisers of all sizes. As we shared last quarter, ads will continue to play an important role in the new search experience and will continue to experiment with new formats native to SGE. SGE is creating new opportunities for us to improve commercial journeys for people by showing relevant ads alongside search results. We've also found that people are finding ads either above or below the AI-powered overview helpful as they provide useful options for people to take action and connect with businesses. Looking at our strong search performance for the fourth quarter, retail was a highlight. We continue to see a stronger start to the season up to and including Cyber 5. In Q3, we indicated that we were seeing early trends of consumers being very price conscious, and we saw this play out in Q4. With promotional demand at an all-time high, deal seekers using Google had access to two times the deals in the US versus last season, as well as a better shopping experience. Launches included a one-stop shop deals destination, new filters like Get It Fast, and AI-generated gifting recommendations in SGE. These new features drove incremental query growth during key shopping moments like Cyber 5. Our proven AI-powered ad solutions were also a win for retailers looking to accelerate omni-growth and capture holiday demand. Quick examples include a large US big box retailer who drove a 60% plus increase in Omni ROAS and a 22% plus increase in store traffic using Performance Max during Cyber 5. And a well-known global fashion brand who drove a 15% plus higher Omni-channel conversion rate versus regular shopping traffic by showcasing its store pickup offering across top markets through pickup later on shopping ads. Moving on to YouTube, we're obviously pleased with YouTube's advertising revenue growth in Q4 and also significant growth in our subscription revenue. I'll reiterate what I have said before. YouTube success starts with creator success. We give millions of creators more ways to create content and connect with fans and more ways to make money and build their own businesses than any other platform. More creators means more content, which leads to more viewers. And via ads and subscriptions, these viewers fund our creators and drive the eyeballs and engagement our advertisers want. To keep this momentum going, we're focused on delivering value across four pillars, creation, viewers, monetization, and responsibility. First, creation, which increasingly takes place on mobile devices. We've invested in a full suite of tools, including our new YouTube Create app for shorts, to help people make everything from 15 seconds shorts to 15 minute videos to 15 hour live streams with a production studio in the palm of their hands. Gen AI is supercharging these capabilities. Anyone with a phone can swap in a new backdrop, remove background extras, translate their video into dozens of languages, all without a big studio budget. We're excited about our first products in this area from dream screen for AI generated backgrounds to allowed for AI powered dubbing. There's more to come. Number two, viewers. We continue to grow watch time across YouTube with strong growth in shorts and connected TV. 
Shorts remains a top priority. We have 2 billion plus logged in users every month and we are averaging 70 billion in daily views. Connected TVs, or what we refer to as the living room, is where viewership is growing the fastest. We're investing to make this experience even better with interactive features tailored to TVs, plus the content people love. Our creators, NFL Sunday Ticket, and a range of live sports and studio content via YouTube TV and primetime channels. Put this all together and YouTube is the must-have app on every connected TV. Monetization is pillar number three and realized through a combination of ad supported and subscription offerings. Advertising generates the bulk of our revenue and we continue to invest heavily here. We've rolled out CTV first formats like 30 second non-skippable ads and pause experiences, as well as an industry first send to phone experience that lets people use a second screen to engage with ads. For shorts, we've developed new formats that are less interruptive to viewers. It's early, we're learning, but excited by the opportunities for ads this can unlock. Shorts monetization continues to progress nicely. Our AI-powered video formats from video reach and video view campaigns to demand gen and video action continue to make advertiser dollars go further and drive results across the funnel. We're also introducing new and existing advertisers to YouTube via sports content. 90 plus upfront and scatter advertisers, including Unilever, are partnering with YouTube in our first year across NFL Sunday ticket in-game advertising opportunities. Our subscription offerings are also growing at a healthy clip. YouTube Music and Premium performed well. Premium users are delivering more value to our partners and YouTube than even ad-supported users do. On average, each additional premium sign-up boosts earnings for creators, music and media partners, and YouTube itself. And we've made premium even more attractive with new features, bundles, and other enhancements. We're also pleased with our first season of NFL Sunday Ticket. It gave creators new opportunities to create content and feed user engagement across traditional user content and professional sports content. Feedback on the user experience, including multi-view, has been great. We're excited to continue to innovate here. Responsibility is our fourth pillar and it underlines everything we do across YouTube. We continue to focus relentlessly on this. As always, deepening our relationships with key partners to bring them the best of Google is a key priority for us and we continue to do this across industries in Q4. We just talked about the NFL, Sunda mentioned Samsung among others earlier. Another highlight was our expanded partnership with Porsche to enhance customers' digital experiences with a deeper in-vehicle integration of Google built-in services, including Google Maps and Play. Whether it's continued collaboration with our partners and key ecosystems, or putting Google AI to work for more customers, I'm excited about the opportunities for continued impact in 2024. I'll wrap with a huge note of gratitude to our customers and partners our success is only possible because of their success. And then to our Googlers for their outstanding work and focus this year. Ruth, over to you. Thank you, Philip. We are very pleased with our full year results with 2023 Alphabet revenues of 307 billion, up 9% versus 2022, which added 25 billion to revenues for the year. We ended with a strong fourth quarter with consolidated revenues of 86.3 billion, up 13% versus last year in both reported and constant currency. Search remained the largest contributor to revenue growth. My comments will be on year over year comparisons for the fourth quarter unless I state otherwise. Total cost of revenues was 37.6 billion, up 6%. Other cost of revenues was $23.6 billion, up 5%, with the increase driven primarily by content acquisition costs associated with YouTube subscription offerings. The growth rate also reflects the offsetting benefit of lapping $1.2 billion in inventory-related charges that we called out in the fourth quarter last year, as well as a reduction in depreciation expense due to changes in estimated useful lives we made starting in the first quarter of 2023. In terms of total expenses, the year-on-year -year comparisons reflect an additional $1.2 billion in exit charges that we took in the fourth quarter of 2023 in connection with actions to optimize our global office space. 
As you can see in our earnings release, these charges were allocated across the expense lines in other cost of revenues and OPEX based on associated headcount. Operating expenses were $25 billion, up 11%, primarily reflecting an increase in R&D expenses, which were driven by the real estate charges, followed by compensation. Operating income was $23.7 billion, up 30%, and our operating margin was 27%. Net income was $20.7 billion, and EPS was $1.64. We delivered free cash flow of $7.9 billion, which was affected by the timing of the $10.5 billion tax payment we made on October 16th that we called out previously related to the deferral of certain tax payments to the fourth quarter. For the full year 2023, free cash flow was $69 billion. We repurchased a total of $62 billion of our Class A and Class C shares in 2023 and ended the year with $111 billion in cash and marketable securities. Turning to segment results, within Google Services, revenues were $76.3 billion, up 12%. Google search and other advertising revenues of $48 billion in the quarter were up 13%, led again by growth in retail. YouTube advertising revenues of $9.2 billion were up 16%, driven by both direct response and brand advertising. Network advertising revenues of $8.3 billion were down 2%. Subscriptions, platforms, and devices revenues, which we previously referred to as other revenues, were $10.8 billion, up 23%, primarily reflecting growth in YouTube subscription revenues. TAC was $14 billion, up 8%. Google Services operating income was $26.7 billion, up 32%, and the operating margin was 35%. Turning to the Google Cloud segment, revenues were $9.2 billion for the quarter, up 26%. We're very pleased with the momentum of GCP with an increasing contribution from AI. Google Workspace also delivered strong revenue growth, primarily driven by increases in average revenue per seat. Google Cloud delivered operating income of $864 million and an operating margin of 9%. As to our other bets, for the full year 2023, revenues were $1.5 billion and the operating loss was $4.1 billion. Results in the fourth quarter benefited from a milestone payment in one of the other bets. Turning to our outlook for the business, with respect to Google services, first within advertising, we were pleased with the sequential revenue growth of search and YouTube advertising throughout 2023, which reflects the extraordinary work across our teams to drive improved experiences for users and attractive ROI for advertisers. As we enter 2024, with advertising revenues of more than $100 billion higher than 2019, we remain focused focused on sustaining healthy growth on this larger base. Second, within subscriptions, platforms, and devices. Our total revenues from subscription products reached $15 billion for the full year 2023, driven primarily by substantial growth in subscribers for our YouTube subscription offerings. The substantial increase in our subscription revenues over the past few years demonstrates the ability of our teams to deliver high value-add offerings and provides a strong base on which to build, including through YouTube and newer services like Google one. Play had solid growth again in the fourth quarter, driven primarily by an increase in the number of buyers. In devices, we continue to make sizable investments with increased emphasis on our Pixel family, particularly with AI-powered innovation, while driving further efficiencies across the portfolio. Turning to Google Cloud, we are pleased with operating performance in the year. 
Full year revenues of $33 billion were up 26% versus prior year, ending with strong Q4 performance. The cloud team is intensely focused on bringing the benefits of Gemini, our industry-leading AI technology, to enterprises and governments globally, and we are gratified with the level of engagement. The strong demand we are seeing for our vertically integrated AI portfolio is creating new opportunities for Google Cloud across every product area. In terms of profitability, the improvement in 2023 reflects sustained focus across the team with the intent to maintain healthy profitability while we continue to invest to support long-term growth. Turning to margins and expenses, as we have repeatedly stressed, we remain committed to our framework to durably re-engineer our cost base as we invest to support our growth priorities. Key contributors to moderating our expense growth include First, product and process prioritization to ensure we have the right resources behind our most important opportunities and to reallocate resources where we can. Second, organizational efficiency and structure. We're focused on removing layers to simplify execution and drive velocity. Both product prioritization and the organization design efforts result in a slower pace of hiring, as you can see with our headcount down year on year, reflecting the reductions we announced in the first quarter of 2023 and a much slower pace of hiring. We will continue to invest in top technical and engineering talent. Finally, we continue to execute the other work streams to slow expense growth, including improving efficiency in our technical infrastructure, streamlining operations across Alphabet through the use of AI, increasing efficiency of our spend with suppliers and vendors through our central procurement organization, and optimizing our real estate portfolio. With respect to CapEx, our reported CapEx in the fourth quarter was $11 billion, driven overwhelmingly by investment in our technical infrastructure, with the largest component for servers followed by data centers. The step up in CapEx in Q4 reflects our outlook for the extraordinary applications of AI to deliver for users, advertisers, developers, cloud enterprise customers, and governments globally, and the long-term growth opportunities that offers. In 2024, we expect investment in CapEx will be notably larger than in 2023. With regard to other bets, we've been working to sharpen our investment focus while capturing the upside given compelling technology breakthroughs across the portfolio. For example, last week, Alphabet's X announced that it would be moving to spin out more projects as independent companies through external capital, giving X the opportunity to bring more focus to the breakthrough technologies it is working on to address some of the world's most pressing challenges. Thank you. Sundar, Philip, and I will now take your questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To prevent any background noise, we ask that you please mute your line once your question has been stated. And our first question comes from Brian Nowak with Morgan Stanley. Your line is now open. Great. Thanks for taking my questions. I have, I have two for Philip. Philip, the, the first one is about sort of a lot of the new generative AI advertising tools. You, know, you obviously have a lot of irons in the fire here, even talking about some of the early momentum with tens of thousands of advertisers. The question is, can you sort of walk us through some of the, the hurdles and gating factors that we should be thinking through that dictate the pace at which these tools can really be rolled out broadly, just so we and advertisers can kind of get an understanding for when they could have a, a bigger impact on the whole business? And then secondly, how do you think about the, the long-term sales force intensity of the advertising business as you roll more AI-based tools like PMAX impacting the overall ad allocation? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I've covered this uh, a little bit on uh, previous uh, quarters. Uh, AI has been at the core of our advertising uh, products for a very, very long time. And um, in the recent advances are really allowing us to drive more value for advertisers across a large range of different areas, um, bidding, targeting, uh, creative, um, as well as our core advertiser and publisher experiences. Um, we are um, seeing in core search ads 
that's, for example, the bidding side, the value-based bidding as a very significant one on the targeting side, the broad match on creatives, responsive search ads, uh, automatically created um, ads, uh, assets, and uh, we're very happy uh, with the progress we're seeing in those areas. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, in one of the previous calls um, that one, you ask about hurdles and gating factors, uh, the AI essentials play a huge role in this, trying to get everybody ready to really take full advantage of those tools. Um, we talked about um, the progress on PMAX as well um, that we were very happy with in uh, Q4. Um, so overall, I think uh, we're on track with what we're expecting here. Um, on the Salesforce, uh, intensity side um, we have uh, done a few um, reallocations or let me call it uh, portfolio adjustments um, as you know we have um, two uh, large different uh, teams one is our LCS a large customer solutions team that's really focused on transformational growth for our largest and most sophisticated customers and we have our um, we call them GCS global customer solutions team uh, which is the channel where really every customer starts um, from some of our largest customers now to also the millions of smaller ones and SMB um, the GCS uh, is really then scaling growth by dynamically delivering really the right treatment for every uh, customer. And important to note, it's also our fastest growing channel and it delivered particularly strong growth uh, in Q4. So um, we have uh, done adjustments here uh, to focus more resources on the GCS side. Um, but I also want to be clear when we restructure, uh, there's always an opportunity to be more efficient and smarter in how we service and uh, grow uh, our customers. Uh, we're not restructuring because AI is taking away roles. That's important here. Um, but we see significant uh, opportunities here with our AI powered solution to actually uh, deliver incredible uh, ROI at scale. And that's why we're doing some of those uh, adjustments. Uh, so I look at Salesforce intensity as uh, a stronger focus going forward on uh, the channels I mentioned here. Great. Thanks, Philip. Our next question comes from Doug Amuth with JP Morgan. Your line is now open. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, one for Ruth and one for Philip. Um, Ruth, you're now into year two of durably re-engineering the cost structure. Can you just help us assess your progress so far and are there any guideposts that we should be thinking about going forward? And then Philip, uh, can you talk more about NFL Sunday ticket and just what your key learnings were in year one? How are you thinking about the returns on the investment uh, on both, you know, from an advertising perspective and then also subscribers to both Sunday ticket and YouTube TV? Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. So we are um, very pleased with the progress we're continuing to make and we are very committed to the framework to durably re-engineer our cost base really as, as we're investing to support the growth priorities. I tried to call out a number of them in opening comments, but really as, as you're looking at the work being done across um, Google, across Alphabet, it does start with product and process prioritization to make sure we've got the right resources behind the most important opportunities and then that creates the opportunity for reallocating resources where we can and then we talked a lot about this quarter about um, organizational efficiency and structure, and we're focused on removing layers to simplify execution and drive um, velocity. The combination of those two, product prioritization and organizational design work, has resulted in the slower pace of hiring. You can see that in our headcount um, numbers down year on year. You can see it in um, some of the in the results that we delivered uh, in the fourth quarter. You can you know, and it also goes to to um, the announcements around uh, first quarter and much slower pace of hiring. At this point in the quarter, we do estimate that severance-related expense will be roughly $700 million in the first quarter as we've continued these efforts. Um, but as I said in opening comments, we will continue to invest in top engineering. So that's sort of the big one if you start with product prioritization and organizational design, which is why I also made the note about the severance-related expense, which helps pave the way as we're continuing to do the work that we're doing. But then we have a host of other work streams, which I talked about, everything with improving efficiency in our technical infrastructure, which is a very large ongoing effort, uh, streamlining operations across Alphabet through use of AI, all the work we're doing with our suppliers and vendors, the work we're doing optimizing our real estate portfolio. So when we've described durably re-engineering, it's about continuing to build on work that started and that is ongoing. 
So on uh, the NFL Sunday ticket side, um, look, as I said earlier, NFL Sunday ticket supports our long-term strategy and really helps solidify YouTube's position as a must-have app on everyone's uh, TV set. Um, you ask about some of the learnings. Maybe I started with the viewing experience. Um, we've received great feedback so far. People like the navigation, multi-view, uh, the chat, uh, the lack of latency. Um, really, really positive feedback on this one. Um, you ask about uh, the ads and the subs. Maybe I started with the subscribers. Um, we're pleased with the NFL Sunday ticket signups in our first season, um, both as part of the YouTube TV bundle and as a standalone offering on YouTube primetime channels. Remember, you can access them via both. Uh, nothing more to share uh, on the sub side uh, today on this one. Uh, on the ad side, as you know, uh, advertisers can buy from an NFL lineup as part of our YouTube select uh, portfolio. And, and this actually allows advertisers to reach football fans uh, across YouTube's pretty unique uh, breadth of NFL content, um, independently of whether you're doing live NFL games or on, on YouTube TV or primetime channels or watching NFL highlights uh, or post-game commentary on YouTube channels. And we saw solid demand across the ad market around our YouTube Sunday ticket offering here. Uh, we're excited about the partnership ahead uh, or the partnerships ahead. This is our first season. And I mentioned over 90 upfront and scatter advertisers partnered with YouTube in our first year uh, across NFL Sunday ticket in-game opportunities, um, which we really appreciate. Thank you both. Our next question comes from Eric Sheridan with Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. Thank you for taking the questions, too, if I could. So, Nor, a bigger picture question coming back to your comments earlier in the call on search generative experience. When you think about the evolution of product over the next couple of years, how do you envision uh, more traditional search and things like the Google Assistant continue to evolve in a world of search generative experience and BARD and what that might mean for elements of commercial and non-commercial search and how use cases might change in the years ahead? And then, Ruth, I just wanted to make sure we understood some of the messaging from the release and the uh, public comments around one-timers in the quarter itself. It seems as if they were not allocated to the segments, but are more elements of other bets and alphabet-level activities. I just wanted to confirm where elements of those one-timers were captured in the P&L statement, and whether there were also any elements of legal one-timers that, that, that would be called out this quarter as well. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, great question. Uh, look, it is an uh, exciting time. Uh, clearly, you know, as I said, you know, as we are incorporating SGE in the product, uh, the early feedback is positive, and we've been iterating on it, um, and it clearly uh, works for a certain type of queries very well. We are expanding the set of queries where it works very well. It definitely is answering a certain category of queries uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for the first time in a better way. So that gives us uh, direction to proceed as well. Overall, one of the things I think people underestimate about search is, uh, you know, the, the breadth of search, the amount of queries we see constantly on a, uh, a, a on a new day, which we haven't seen before. And so the trick here is to deliver that high quality experience across the breadth of what we see in search. Um, and over time, we think Assistant will be uh, very complementary, and we will again use uh, generative AI there, uh, uh, particularly with our most advanced models in BARD, uh, you know, and allows us to you know, act more like an agent over time, if I were to think about the future, and maybe you know, go beyond answers and, uh, and follow through for users even more. So that is the directionally what the opportunity set is, obviously a lot of execution ahead. Uh, but it's an area where I think we have a deep sense of what to do and all the work we have taken so far, the feedback has been uh, super positive. And then in terms of um, your other question, so on the real estate charge, the $1.2 in exit charges related to real estate, that is in alphabet level activities. But the other comment I was making in opening comments is where you, when you go through the various line items, um, R&D, et cetera, you see it spread there and we have a table and IR can walk anybody through the technicals on that just to understand how it then gets arrayed across the various lines in the P&L. Our next question comes from Michael Nathanson with Muffet Nathanson. Your line is now open. Thanks. I have, uh, I have two for Philip, I think. Given the importance of connected TV engagement on YouTube, can you talk about the opportunity outside the U.S. for connected TV and what 
the companies doing at large to drive more adoption of YouTube or connected TVs, you know, given the Google operating systems, anything you talk about outside the U.S. And then you've been consistent about the strength of shorts over the past year. You talk a bit about the monetization challenges. Do you still see the headwinds that you saw at the beginning? Anything you can share about the density of the auction or advertising interest on shorts? So help us with, with whether or not that's still a headwind to growth. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for your question. Um, on the connected TV side, uh, I mentioned it actually uh, continues to perform really well. Uh, I said before, YouTube is the leader in US streaming watch time. Um, and uh, it's not uh, just one audience group uh, diving deep. It's really uh, all audiences uh, on the international side. Uh, it's something uh, we are uh, closely looking at. There's nothing specific, uh, I have to add, uh, at this moment in time uh, on this one. Um, on the short uh, monetization side, um, look, uh, we, we built shorts to respond to the huge demand from both uh, creators and viewers for short form video. Um, and we're very pleased with the growth we've seen. I mentioned 2 billion plus locked in users every month, uh, 70 billion in daily uh, views. Um, specifically to the monetization question, um, shorts monetization continues to progress nicely. Um, in, in fact, actually, since we introduced uh, revenue sharing for shorts, uh, the total creator earnings generated from shorts have increased every uh, month. And we expect this to uh, continue and uh, similar uh, obviously to our long form videos we're really committed here to a long term uh, partnership and uh, you heard me say this before right when creators succeed uh, we uh, succeed thanks Philip. our next question comes from Stephen Ju with UBS please go your line is not open okay thank you so much so Philip this is not a new question but um it's also been about two years since PMAPS was launched, but it seems like there's been this long lineage of product development and rollout of things like smart bidding in, in your history, which I believe at the time was designed to help smaller advertisers more easily run search advertising. And today, uh, you're helping me generate creatives as well as manage my spend and maximize ROI across multiple Google services. So, you know, how are you feeling about enabling SMBs who otherwise could not advertise with you before? Um, and what kind of TAM expansion tailwind does that create for your revenue growth uh, over the longer term? Thanks. Look, as you know, uh, SMBs are a huge focus uh, for us. Uh, uh, we mentioned this uh, several times before. Um, they're big, they're part of our GCS uh, channel. Not only there's more in this, um, but they've uh, been under a ton of change over the last few years. And our focus has always been here on investing in solutions that uh, really help level the playing field. And you mentioned uh, several of those. Um, so actually, SMBs can compete with bigger brands and more sophisticated uh, advertisers. And uh, so the feedback we're always getting is they need easy solutions that drive value quickly and several of the AI port solutions that you're mentioning are actually making the workflow and the whole on-ramp and the uh, bid targeting creative and so on you mentioned it uh, so much easier for SMBs uh, so we're very satisfied uh, with what we're seeing here we will continue to invest and uh, I feel AI is really a, a helpful a very interesting future path uh, to make life uh, not only easier but also uh, much more productive and better ROIs over time more level playing field uh, for SMBs Our next question comes from Justin Post with BAML. Your line is now open. Great. Maybe one for Sundar and one for Ruth. Um, just on search growth, uh, I think there are some concerns on, on use of competitive AI tools as an alternative to search. Just wondering if you've seen any changes in, in query volumes, positive or negative, since you've uh, seen the year evolve and, and more search generative experiences and what can really make Google stand out versus other AI tools. And then, Ruth, CapEx was $11 billion, a step up, obviously. Any one-time items in there, or is that how we should think about the new run rate into 24? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Justin. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, look, we think about effects on search, uh, you know, obviously more broadly. Uh, people have a lot of information choices, and so... Uh, and user expectations are constantly evolving. Uh, and so we, we've been doing this for a long time. And I think what ends up mattering is a, a, a strong, continuous track record of innovation. Uh, obviously, generative AI 
is uh, is as a is a new tool in the arsenal uh, but there's a lot more that goes into search the breadth the depth uh, the diversity across verticals the ability to follow through uh, getting actually access to rich diverse sources of content on the web and putting it all together uh, in a compelling way and i think uh, through the year 2 when we test we test search generative experience particularly uh, against everything that's out there and you know we can see uh, the progress we are making and how much users are liking the experience better uh, and so i think you know feel very good about the progress and uh, and our roadmap for uh, 24 uh, is strong uh, both on the search and the underlying um, ai progress including the models so i'm pretty excited about what's ahead of us in 24 and with respect to CapEx, the, the CapEx of $11 billion in the fourth quarter, as indicated, was overwhelmingly investment in our technical infrastructure. To your question, there was no one-time item in there. Uh, it really reflects is our outlook for everything Sundar and, and Philip and I have been talking about, the extraordinary applications of AI within uh, Google DeepMind, Google Services, Google Cloud. It's across the board for users, for advertisers, developers, cloud enterprise customers, um, governments, and it's really the long-term opportunity that offers. So last quarter, we did note that CapEx would continue to grow in 2024. We do expect 2024 full-year CapEx to be notably larger um, than 2023. As, as a note, um, I think you all know this, but uh, timing of cash payments can affect the quarterly CapEx number, but the main point is we're continuing to invest. Our next question comes from Ross Sandler with Barclays. Your line is now open. Great, thanks. Um, so I guess a question for, I don't know if it's Sundar or Philip, but um, if we go back to the, uh, the DOJ trial that happened in the fall, there was a document that uh, was disclosed from, uh, from Google that said something along the lines of uh, why leaning on ad quality team to deliver 20% RPM growth in search is a, a fragile strategy. And it was dating back to 2019. Um, your business has, I think, more than doubled since then. So I guess as we sit here today in early 2024, how do you feel about Google's ability to drive search RPM going forward? And I guess in the context of what Ruth said tonight about the large revenue base, just how do you feel about the monetization. Thank you. Uh, look, I think um, you know I have I have tremendous uh, confidence in the quality driven both you know our work be it search quality, ads quality, our improvements on search, our improvements on ads RPM. All you know, two foundational pillars are you know, uh, extraordinary focus on ads quality so that we deliver the actual ROI to advertisers and improve the experience for users and all underpinned by rigor and technical excellence and, and go-to-market excellence, right? So the fundamental attributes don't change. Uh, I think AI gives us opportunity both on the organic side as well as on the monetization side. And I think we are in the early days of it. I think we'll be able to taking a long-term view, uh, serve information need, uh, needs in a deeper way. And, you know, so I think about it in that, with that long-term context, and I'm pretty excited about what's ahead. And our last question will be from Mark Mahaney with Evercore. Your line is now open. Okay, thanks. One question on... Um, um, YouTube AI and one on cloud. On cloud first, there's there's just this volatility, this material deceleration last quarter and then nice reacceleration this quarter. Is that explained by where we are in the optimization cycle and it may be generative AI workloads starting to trickle in now and cause that growth curve to bend back up? Any commentary just on the sort of the volatility, the deceleration, and the reacceleration that we've seen. And then, um, Philip, I want to ask on the, uh, on the creative side, and uh, particularly on uh, YouTube and ads and the creative, using AI to improve the creative and really to offer um, SMBs who have been with Google forever, but offer them now performance-based video ad campaigns, uh, you know, 
uh, created by AI. Is that kind of a new growth area? Um, uh, how far along are you in terms of uh, uh, offering this out into the market? And do you think that this opens up a new you know, area of, of uh, spend that wasn't there before? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. On, on cloud, uh, let me take that. You know, first of all, uh, you know, uh, you know, combi- a combination of factors. I think, uh, I think, definitely, uh, you know, excitement around uh, the AI solutions uh, on top of our foundational pillar, be data analytics, infrastructure, security, etc. But AI is definitely something uh, which is, which is driving interest and uh, early adoption, and you know, as uh, as you know, you saw that greater than 70% of Gen AI unicorns are using uh, Google Cloud. And so I think it's an area where our strengths will continue to play out uh, as we go through 24, uh, especially when I look at the innovation ahead uh, from us on the AI front. And second, I think, uh, you know, uh, there are regional variations, but you know the cost optimizations uh, in many parts are are something we have mostly worked through, and uh, I think that was a contributing uh, factor as well. So on your YouTube question, maybe let me start with a general view. Uh, YouTube's mission, you know, has enabled millions of creators around the world to share their voice and connect with audiences and obviously build thriving businesses here. And AI has been a very critical piece of this already. Um, You are obviously aware of the made on YouTube announcement where we introduced a whole lot of uh, new uh, complementary creativity features on YouTube, including Dream Screen, for example, um, and um, a lot of other uh, really interesting uh, tools and thoughts um, you can uh, obviously uh, imagine um, that we can take this uh, more actively to the advertising world already. As you know, um, it continues uh, already to power AI, a lot of our video ad solutions and measurement uh, capabilities. Um, it's part of uh, video reach campaigns, uh, multi-format ads are. Uh, actually, there is uh, um, generative creator music um, um, that actually makes it easier for creators to design the perfect soundtrack uh, already. And uh, as I said earlier, AI will unlock a new world uh, of creativity uh, and you can see uh, how this will um, if you just look at uh, where models are heading where multimodal models are heading where the generation capabilities of those models are heading you can absolutely see uh, how this will impact and and positively impact uh, and simplify the flow for creators uh, similar to uh, what you see already emerging in some of our uh, core products uh, like ACA on the search side thank you Thank you, and that concludes our question and answer session for today. I'd like to turn the conference back over to Jim Friedland for any further remarks. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to speaking with you again on our first quarter 2024 call. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.